Um, I'm not turning my microphone on. All right. Oh, that's better. All right. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us. We have a great panel today. Um, here to talk about the future of STEM learning and what role innovation plays in the future of STEM learning. Um, I was told I'm not to introduce the panelists one by one, but so you know, we have a great mix of sectors represented here. Um, private sector, um, public sector, federal policy expertise, and decades of experience bringing STEM learning to the masses. So, you know, we're here really to, to talk about what the future of learning looks like, and the future of learning is being driven by the future of work. And the changes to the future of work are happening at speeds that are requiring the conversations on the future of learning to use words like innovation, um, to use words like disruption. But what, what does that mean when I think all of us in the room probably agree that the future of learning requires a future of equity, it requires equity of access, it requires equity of opportunity and access to those opportunities. And so as we're using words like innovation that are tied to words like disruption, where there are communities that aren't allowed to be disruptive, what does the future of innovative learning look like? Um, yeah, so uh, Peter, do you want to start us off with some, yeah. some notes about what's happening in San Diego? Happy to. Uh, I'm with the Workforce Partnership here in San Diego. Thank you all for coming to San Diego for this amazing summit. I've been able to be a part of it now for the last three or four years that it's been here, and it's, it's just such an inspiring environment. And, and really, this is innovation in action, is sharing great ideas and putting out best practices, learning from one another. In the world of workforce, if you don't know briefly, we're made up of 550 entities around the country where Department of Labor funds primarily flow, and then locally we figure out where the, the need is and then invest in different funded partners throughout the region who serve targeted populations to get them into the workforce. So that's what we do across the country. At the Workforce Partnership here locally, we're also a 501c3, so we work with private sector and philanthropic funds in order to expand our impact. And, and one thing that I'm really proud of lately that we've done to, to truly innovate is to really think way outside our lane of, of what I just described. And in, in doing so, we've created in our world of workforce development the first income share agreement arrangement uh, in our space. So for those of you in the education world, that may be more familiar, but that's where we fund the cost of the, the schooling for the student, the adult learner in this case, in order to have access to higher ed. In, in the case of, of our ISA work, we partnered with UCSD Extension locally as our education partner. We're working with VEMO Education, V-E-M-O, as an intermediary and, and partners around the region. So we've raised three and a half million dollars now through philanthropic funds that will allow us to support the cost of access for these post-secondary degrees. So in step one of our, our vision for this work is we're gonna have a 100-person cohort in four different IT tracks, so right in the STEM lane, in order to go from where they are now to be able to make a much better income. And it's so different from the student loan approach because with ISAs, the payment is up front. We, we um, take on that cost. The payback by the student is based upon their future income. So in the case of our, our setup, they have to make at least $40,000 a year upon graduation to even have to pay back. So we have a lot of incentive to succeed, as do they, as do the UCSD Extension, our partner. And when it succeeds, that payback to the fund will open up more access for more uh, students to be able to access great careers. So that's the vision. Year one, 100-person cohort. Year two, we hope to double it and we could double thereafter for some time to come because with the model, we keep refueling that fund, serving more people, and in the end, this is going to provide access, equity, and remove that barrier of the cost of, of higher ed. So that's one area of, of innovation that we're working on, and uh, I'll end there because we got a lot to cover. So that's really interesting, and 
because they're really paying it forward. Pay it so forward. like the idea that the money that I'm paying is going to pay for someone else like me to get educated That's it. is a lot more comforting than writing a check to Sally Mae. Right. Every month. So That's I just it. really I really like that. We're excited and so stay tuned next year. We'll have a whole other story to tell and hopefully a lot of great outcomes. But as you may know in in student loans there's 1.5 trillion in growing student debt crisis that we have in the country. This can change that whole game, and that's why we're particularly excited because we want people to achieve the, the American dream, and they can do that if they have access to the education it requires. How many partners do you have with this pilot? Well, four th philanthropic investors, and it's also exciting because this is not a pay for performance, and they're going to be earning a return, or if we blow it, we have to pay it all back. They believe in this concept so much that they're investing in this work. Sestrada so Education Group, who's here, and uh, Google is on board, a local philanthropist, and then recently the James Irvine Foundation. So it's exciting that we have those partners. As I mentioned, Vimo Education, UCSD Extension is our educational partner. And then down the road, we want to open it up to more education partners and other sectors beyond IT. Yeah, I asked that because this, this conversation around partnership is super, super important. Um, and partnership, I think everybody on this panel knows, does not come easy. Mm -hmm. um, Ruth, I know you especially have some ideas about what needs to change um, as it relates to public-private partnerships in support of the future of learning. Um, yeah, so um, you know, I work in, Ruth Farmer, I work in the Computer Science for All initiative, which is this enormous effort to really transform K-12 education in the biggest way that's happened in, you know, since we established the schools in the 1800s. And um, it's this massive distributed thing of lots and lots of people all over the country working in different ways. And lots of corporations have, you know, very specific needs and ways that they want to participate. And um, I've been seeing a trend that worries me of this sort of like siloed, like, I'm going to create a thing. I'm going to invest in K-12 middle schoolers. And then I'm going to make them take my class in high school. And then I'm going to give them a scholarship and an internship at my company. And I was like, well, that's, that's a pretty narrow slice of kids that you're giving yourself access to versus a rising tide lifts all boats approach. And, and I would argue that there is nothing that a five-year-old today is learning that pertains to a job they're going to have. Hmm. that it's really more about I want all kids to learn computation and learn digital skills because they're going to create the jobs of the future, not to fill a slot in a particular company's roster right now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I know there's a lot of urgency around filling the 500,000 tech jobs, but I think we know that tech moves really fast and the ways of work are changing really quickly. So. I would really urge everyone to take a investment approach that is investing in everyone, right? And versus this kind of narrow, I'm gonna get mine and I'm gonna hold on to them. Because the reality, I mean, obviously you can't make children indentured servants to a scholarship, right? That's not something that is ethical in the first place. Um, and so how do we, also, those, those assessments of who has potential have a lot of bias embedded in them. Mm -hmm. so, um, so one of the things I encourage companies to do is think about, one, investing in existing infrastructure. Like, we can reach 7 million kids if we put computer science in the Boys and Girls Club mm. versus creating your own separate club at your, at your company, kind of an idea. Um, you know, invest in existing infrastructure, use um, things that you already do as part of your work, you know, so banks, for example, I encourage banks and credit unions, they communicate with their customers every day. You could be sending messages home in the bills to the parents about computer science. Like, there's a way that a bank could do something that doesn't harm their bottom line, mm -hmm. but allows them to contribute. Or have tours, you know, that's another thing. Invite kids to come on tour and see your IT system. Say you're a power company in rural Virginia. Like every power company has an, a technology infrastructure that they could be sharing with the schools. So like those are the kinds of things that I want companies to be thinking about. Please write us checks. We absolutely want your checks, but um, please don't write a curriculum for us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Come on, come on. So I know you have stick, on that. stick to what you know. <laughs> yeah, stay in your lane, people. <laughs>
Well, it, it, <laughs> saying I got a thought on it, I do. I think uh, my name is Kamal Bob. I'm uh, from Georgia Tech. And with regards to the question asked about the partnerships, I think that there is um, there's a challenge related to that about innovation itself. I think um, if we're concerned about those students and or communities who don't have the access and the road paved for them, I think that we ought to step back a bit and think about what innovation means in the context of the social, the social contract. Uh, the, the higher ed space, as you know, is itself kind of broken. It doesn't really have access for general people, as evidenced by this cheating scandal. Kind of rich people have access to it in ways that everybody else doesn't. The public school system, uh, I think also in the context of computing, we're focused on computing for sure. But in just the last 18 months or so, Oakland, LA, Denver, Arizona, Oklahoma, South Carolina, they're all on strike. Uh, and so the, the social contract itself is broken for the students that we're most concerned about. So that the way that you're talking about uh, partners and companies are going after these siloed um, strategies, they're overlooking the fact that the basic structure that they're putting their siloed strategies on is itself broken. And so I think in our sense of uh, what innovation means, it's to reconsider what the fine print is in that broken contract. And there I think some of these things are useful for sure, but I think if we're not being realistic about the, um, the lack of access, the lack of formal rigorous education that most students have uh, access to, if we don't reconsider that, then mm -hmm. I think we're not really being innovative, we're just being cute. Yeah, there's a lot of cuteness out there. Um, and I think that, that really teasing apart what access, what equity in access means. So um, folks familiar with Jane Margolis' work with Stuck in the Shallow End see that having a computer science in a school means that there's access, right? But that wasn't enough to actually get the students in the class. And so what, what is access and is it just putting things there or is it you know making sure that folks are informed about how to take advantage of some of those things and well and i think kamau is right in that um the lack of of understanding by those developing the so-called innovations of what the realities of the communities actually are like i had this sort of aha moment last year where I was like, every single person out there developing new platforms and tools to teach computer science and games and, and um, programs is living on a coast, hmm. right? And so if you're living in this world where you have ubiquitous access, and I think about myself personally, I always have at least three devices at my fingertips that I could access the internet at any time. I always have access to the internet so much so that when I don't have it for a few minutes, I get really upset. And that is not the reality for much of our population. For um, low-income kids, um, disproportionately, something like 80% access the internet primarily on their phones. And um, if you're on pay-as-you-go data, you know, are you gonna be using that phone to access online tutorials on how to learn to code, or are you gonna use that to connect with your family or do your homework or whatever it is you're trying to get done. So this, and also the belief that every single person has a device to themselves is so incorrect and wrong and it's like, oh, we'll just get them a computer. You give a computer to a family of four, do you think that kid gets that computer every night for two hours to do whatever autodidactic self-teaching they're supposed to do? No. They're sharing that with their whole family. So I think helping get some more transparency or visibility for what the realities of implementation are in different parts of the U.S. is really critical. Yeah, so, um, so I'm from Washington, D.C., and I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my name is Elle Cronin. I do federal policy work, and, and, and this panel is talking about all sorts of things that um, they're talking about in Washington, D.C., believe it or not. Um, and. Uh, I think that the terms that we're using, so I love all the terms that we use in, in venues like this. We talk about innovation, we talk about disruption, even the term STEM, even the term computer science, they all mean something different to the person saying them than they mean to the person hearing those words. And I think in Washington, D.C., um, uh, folks who have been elected to represent you in Congress throw around the term innovation left and right. I, um, I think 
anybody who watched the Facebook hearings should be super who, scared. Who watched the Facebook hearings? <laughs> yeah, you should be super scared about what they think is innovative. Um, and I think in the education world, what we're seeing right now um, is uh, we're, at least in the K-12 world, um, and from a federal policy perspective, we're still reacting to the um, education law that was enacted in 2015 called the Every Student Succeeds Act and the changes that it made, including the inclusion of the term computer science in a federal education law for the first time. Um, but we're not going to have any sort of um, uh, results to look at from that law for at least another couple years. States just recently all had their, their plans approved, and that law is going to be up for revising again in just two years. Right now we're talking about higher ed. We're talking about income sharing agreements in Washington, D.C. There is some urgency around higher ed and innovation in higher ed. Incom income sharing agreements is at the top of the list of innovations in, in, in higher ed. Um, but the windows are, are, are really long in terms of federal policy. We don't move fast in Washington, D.C. That's by design. Um, it's also the, the current state of affairs isn't particularly helpful to speed. Um, but there are all these kids that are being shortchanged by this inertia. Um, and that's frustrating for a policy um, advocate. That's frustrating for, I assume, everybody up here in terms of not only the programs that are, um, you know, the Higher Education Act hasn't been updated in 10 years. Think about higher, how higher education has changed in that time and how those programs are probably shortchanging those changes. Um, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act went 15 years before it was reauthorized. I think we'll look at a, a window that, that that is similar to that for the next time. It's job security for me, but it's really frustrating for folks who are looking for quick change to take care of corporate needs um, in, a, in a fast way. So it, I, I don't mean to be gloom and doom because there are good things happening too. There are people, um, even at the Department of Education, who are using the current programs and education and innovation research program to invest in computer science to try to figure out what is working in schools. Um, there are good things happening too. Um, but I, I feel like innovation, disruption, those are very um, ambiguous terms, particularly in that space. And um, I think the Facebook hearing is like the best example of mm. what we're up against in Washington, D.C. when we're talking about trying to work with some of those folks and on innovations in education. You can see why a happiness journal is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> work in D.C. Yeah. You need to get one. What about if, if we were to consider those two points, the reality that students uh, live in and exist in and the federal inertia, hmm. if we introduce this, since our, our esteemed colleague said, be provocative, so here's some, <laughs> I'll serve the role as a provocateur. In, in Atlanta, I've said this repeatedly, in Atlanta, it turns out, I think, just from this, these lights are extremely bright, but I think I'm the only black man in this room. Uh, oh, we got there's a brother two. right here. Boom. So, but I say that to say this. In Atlanta, this is a story that I've told repeatedly. Atlanta is the second most segregated city in the United States behind Chicago. The school system there is remarkably segregated. So if we're thinking about, again, what innovation means, we're, we're building systems to put on a socially stratified structure that is inherent in the structure itself. And that's getting worse. So the segregation thing is very real. We have a whole host of uh, high schools, regular public traditional high schools in Atlanta where there are no white students at all. And the ones where the innovative things are happening, as you'd expect, happen where the white kids are. And even in the schools where the white kids are, the stratification exists there too. So a lot of the innovations that we're talking about tend to just benefit those white students. This is what Stephanie was alluding to with Jane Margolis' uh, work, where even in those classes where the white kids are, that's where the most uh, innovative things happen. So here's the, the statement. If we were going to decide that segregation is kind of here to stay, that's a terrible to think, just bear with me. If we were just going to decide that that is something that is immutable in the set of variables that we're talking about, what would it look like to then be innovative where we assume that the race and social, uh, race and class stratification that we currently have is not itself immutable? Because you've seen in New York, where Mayor de Blasio was trying to break up some of the stratification with regards to Stuyvesant and Bronx science and so on. And it was like he was a heretic. So the people went wild. So there isn't any real inclination to do that. So if we were going to just take that race and class segregation and hold it as constant, 
would we then be, would we then have a different set of strategies that are trying to be innovative in STEM learning if we hold those things to be constant? And I don't know, but it's not something that we just talk about. We just kind of talk about it as if all students are just going to school, and, but they're not. They're, there's black schools and white schools, rich schools and poor schools, and then schools in the middle of the country and coastal schools. But we're not saying it as if it's the real, it's the reality and it's itself mm -hmm. is its own uh, constraint. So I would throw that out to see well, how would we handle that. I think you're um, on to something in terms of <laughs> the visibility. Did you say he's on something? Well, okay. yeah. <laughs> Look, you already put all the black people on yeah. one side. Yeah. <laughs> like in Ruth's happy universe, we fix the inequality of funding of schools, right? Because I just look at that in my own community where I live, where it's you already have rich parents who are going to be the booster club for a school district, and then because of their tax base, they get all these resources, and then the other you know communities don't. And so I would love it if we could fix that. But assuming we can't fix that, which is what you're saying, um, I would argue that we would look at things as a opportunity or from an abundance viewpoint. I think there's this constant sort of like deficit viewpoint of all of the people, right? The people who need have a deficit and the deficit is them. Even though you're not overtly maybe saying that, you know, we talk about women in tech and we're like, well, women need this. Women need mentors or women need to lean in or women need to be different. And we do the same thing with low-income kids. Well, they need a scholarship, or they need this. And so that's approaching them as a deficit community versus an abundance of opportunity and talent. And so I've been working on this thing that I'm soon to be launching, this idea of like, instead of putting all of our resources into the best of the best kids, right, the best of the best, low-income kids coming out of schools and being these super people, what if we instead invested in incubating the B team? Hmm. The A team is doing fine. Not fine, I mean, they could be better, right? But like as a top low-income student, like if you did a Venn diagram of Coca-Cola, Gates, Buick, and all those big uh, <coughs> Westbridge scholarships, those all the same kids, the same 400 kids. But the kids just below them who just need a chance. But the way we give out, it, we invest in kids is show us how great you already are. Show us your perfect grades, your perfect SATs, everything that's perfect about you. And then we're going to give you some support. But if you stumble, we're going to take it away. And do, you think, do you think that it would be easier to do that if we started from the assumption that the segregation is immutable, and then therefore we wouldn't attribute the deficit identity to those who are one side of the fence versus the other. Because the way that we, I think the way that our current assumptions are, is that these are the others and they are associated with under, at risk, marginalized, all the adjectives that are associated with them. It's because of the expectation that there would be somehow this integration. So these people have those attributes which we have to fix prior to getting them to be in the fold. But if we assume differently, then they're not. They're just, they have the whole spectrum of characteristics that we have. We're not expecting them to come over here and play. So therefore, we would break <coughs> that pattern of deficit syndrome, which I don't think exists among white students, for example. They just have a, a natural spectrum. But everybody else is kind of broken a priori. I would just add to this around with uh, the divide there. The, the divide with zip codes, where you're born, really determines future. Uh, in good and bad ways. If you're lucky enough to be born in a particular zip code or area, you have a great chance of success. And if you're not, the chances are less and less that you're going to um, do better than your parents. Many of you may know Raj Chetty. We were able to do a, a session with him, uh, the economist out of Stanford, now at Harvard, and, and his work on the lost Einsteins, really based upon where you're born, determines your future. And we have to work on whatever we can do to level the playing field. And that takes a lot of intentional investment and time and people and money in order to reach into where people are and their socioeconomic conditions in order to be able to empower them to find their future. So that weighs on us heavily. And another area I just want to raise in, in this work, whenever I see 
work on STEM and initiatives, I love it, but at the same time, it breaks my heart because there's a lot of kids who won't have that STEM opportunity or they're not, they're not wired for STEM, it's not their thing. So we have to make sure that every child um, is of value and has an opportunity to find their place in the world. So STEM is great, but it's not for everybody and we have to always remember that. So we have to ensure there's a lot of other pathways so that kids succeed at whatever uh, they can and to have their place in the world. And, and lastly, the category of opportunity youth is incredibly important to our work. We've uh, dove in in a big way in, in recent years. And if you're back in town, May 2nd, we're having a big summit, Opportunity uh, SD, we call it, and we're bringing together about 800 people. And Sarah Koenig, any Sarah Koenig fans out oh, there? Yeah. She's our keynote. Nice. So with all her work on criminal justice and, and the risk factors that uh, Opportunity Youth face, we're going to be able to dive into that as well. But there's about 5 million Opportunity Youth in our country uh, who are make, having a hard time making that transition from youth to adulthood. It's almost 1 in 10 and they're not going to get these STEM careers for the most part. What are we doing about that? And if we don't reach in and do much more to provide internships and pathways and creative ways to get back into the workforce or education, we know the outcomes and they're not good. And we have to do much more now because with the, the divide, the uh, inequity, and where we are, the social contract, as you say, if we don't do more now, five million and that number keeps growing one in ten roughly and if we don't help them find their place in the world we've got a lot of really difficult outcomes to be dealing with down the road that we don't have to be dealing with if, in, if we invest much much earlier so i want to so i, okay, I just have ahead, to push back on you on this idea of not wired for stem oh we're gonna fight um yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that like frustrates me so much is one, I hate the word STEM because um, STEM is not a thing and it's not, I, I shrugged off the STEM title many years ago and insisted on being tech and engineering because um, STEM is a whole lot of things under a big umbrella and it's, it's become a thing that, like I worry that people in Congress are like, we need STEM, but they really don't know that we actually need engineers and computer scientists, right. and that's what's missing from the STEM education. But this idea of wired for STEM, and I worry about that because um, you see it where even parents and the media and everyone is putting out this, they've got the STEM mindset, or they're a STEM kid, or they have an engineer's brain, and we all, Millions and millions of people learn to play musical instruments and sing, mm -hmm. though many of them do not have talent, right? But they aspire to do that because they see singers and so on. And so there are people who are musical geniuses. You know, I would argue that, you know, Stevie Wonder or Alicia Keys or, is a musical genius, but that does not prevent millions of people from learning music. And so I think our same viewpoint should be of STEM or of computer science is that anything worth doing is going to be hard and you're going to have to work at it. Some people might have a tendency to do it more easily than others. Um, so I always worry about that because you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't say, oh, I can't read worth a darn, but you will hear adults all the time say, well, I'm no good at math. I'm not, a, I don't have a math brain or I don't have the engineer's brain. And so just, you know, just. just I'm going to push back under pushback. <laughs> <laughs> because I hear what you're saying, and maybe the term isn't well put of wired for, but people have different passions that are outside yeah. of coding and engineering and more of the hard skills, if you will, within those areas. And there's value in all the other sectors. Yeah, I think they should all learn. Customer service and retail right. and, and, the, and the trades which are technical too. But when you make it STEAM with the A, then that changes the, the game as well. But I, well, we disagree. <laughs> we, we can disagree, but not hate each other, I've asked as Cindy McCain said. Uh -huh. I mean, just to bring it back to Lou uh -huh. Dellen, right? There's a STEAM and a STEM caucus. Yeah. They're all, you know, even mm -hmm. Congress okay, has yeah, not so figured out. So there's STEAM with the A, which is arts. There's Another STEAM with the A, which is agriculture. There's STREAM, which is religion. Mm -hmm. Ooh, reading? Oh, oh, I'm yeah. reading. Research. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Uh, mm -hmm. um, there's C-STEM, there's C-STEAM, there's all these 
acronyms that, you know, um, I think that people were trying to sort of glom on to STEM. I think that's past. Like, I don't think we're going to get any crazier than C-Stream. Well, but, that, uh, then it's just... Does it have two M's? <laughs> right. does it, is there two M's on oh, it? Because there's the M music. for medicine. And music. music. And, and then the st okay. statisticians were also, they wanted to add an S, so that was statistics was added. Well, we'll just call it yeah. education. Oh, my heavens. Well, yeah, or right. we could just call it school. Right. Okay. And, and be done with it. Yep. But I would, I mean, just to end this whole wired for STEM idea, I think all kids need to learn... I think all kids need to learn computation, period, because the world is digital and that's a big part of our country becoming innovative and also I think it's a big national defense issue that we have digital skills for all kids, regardless of what field they end up going into. Yeah. Can I just give an example of how this plays out? I didn't really say what I do. At, at Georgia Tech, this center that I run is the Constellation Center for Equity and Computing and the premise of it is that the computing uh, that we've been talking about, again, the, the, the school system is incapable of developing it on its own. So we just, there are just not enough teachers who have the wherewithal to be able to do it, and the national strategy has been to pursue uh, professional development, which is, which is reasonable. But the logical end of it still is that, again, the incentive for people to become public school teachers, particularly with a highly valuable skill like computing and computer science right now, is nearly zero. Because you're going into a field where a tenth of the country at the moment is on strike, so it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So you're asking people to make a cherubic sacrifice to do these kinds of things. So our premise is that the professional development is, it's important, like I said, so I don't want to devalue it in any way. But if you're taking uh, the analogy to say that you want to bring an English teacher and over the summer a couple of weeks of professional development transform them into a Spanish teacher, it just doesn't make sense. So here we're asking people to take on a skill set that's highly cognitively kind of dynamic and then lead students who themselves are kind of hesitant about it for all the stereotypical reasons that we understand. So our premise here is that the people are the limiting factor. There's just not enough teachers and not enough faculty, et cetera, et cetera. So what do we then do? Our, the premise is that we don't expect teachers to be the single subject matter experts on their own. I see some like legendary teachers that are here, but Art will attest to you on his own that his colleagues writ large don't necessarily have the aptitude to be able to do this at scale, particularly for the communities that are most uh, challenged in this. So we then say, well, all right, we're going to have to have some kind of modality that is online, as trite as that sounds, that is a hybrid structure where the teachers who, the assets that we're looking for from them is that they have the relationship with the students themselves, they have the confidence, the wherewithal, the trust, the kind of dynamic relationship to take these students and say, well, you will learn this and I'll make you do it. And by the way, I don't know it fully myself, but this is the platform against which I can draw the resources to make it happen. So to me, that's the reasonable outcome. There are a whole host of pedagogical and epistemological reasons there that we don't really have the answers to yet, but nevertheless, I think that's the strategy. But the problem still is that if this is what I'm grappling with, we're going through the STEM, the, to, to, to relate it to the point that we just said. I can go out to colleagues and partners and say, well, this is our strategy because we want to improve STEM education for the United States and competitiveness and all those words that we all throw around and get millions of dollars just like that. But yet, I think central to it, I come back to my two points. One is that the STEM education thing, relevant to what was just said, notwithstanding what I do, I think that we're training people and we're not have, we don't have any educated people. So we're training folks into this scheme without educating them which is why I think we have highly technical, very successful people, but we've created an archetype that's uneducated. And therefore, we have some of the very problems that we're currently contending with. Like, where do we put the, the wall? Does it go north or south of Texas? I mean, if you don't know history, you don't really know. That's one thing. The other is that we're being asked to support a computational infrastructure in public schools where the accountability is solely focused pretty much on STEM stuff. They're not really asking you for a standardized test in comparative literature. There's no standardized test for history of the West Indies, for example, or for Africa, or whatever. We don't have those kinds of things. So we're going down this road of STEM education, like you said, as if it's this thing. We haven't operationalized what it means to have educated people. So now we're coming up with all these fancy words and STEM and STEAM and STREAM and the other thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And so there, I think, again, if we're, if we're coming back to the central question here about what innovation means in this structure, I think we do have to contend with whether or not we accept segregation as an immutable constant or not. 
it's ugly to talk about that in, pu in public for sure, but I think if we don't contend with it, we're, we're constraining ourselves. The other is whether or not we expect education to be valuable in its core, or do we just strip everything off and say, well, look, we just want technical people to go and work, and that's good enough. We also don't like to say that in public, but if it is something that we can publicly agree to, or perhaps it's class, we'll let the rich people get educated and the poor people get trained, and maybe we just assume well, that and that's, that's the exactly case. what's happening with move. all of these, like, you know, one of the things that when I was at the National Center for Women in IT, we started to really worry about was this issue of are women and minorities going to attend boot camps and get trained in a skill, and then white and Asian men continue to get degrees at Stanford and Harvard and become the, the computer scientists, right? And so are we stratifying society even more than it already is? Um, I think that is um, a significant threat. And I also think that this, my base question is, what is school for? And I don't think school is for filling jobs. I think school is for creating citizens of this country. And we are failing, as you said, to educate people. Like, kids are learning nothing about civics. Yeah. Like, I would love to have the I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill back on Saturday mornings because <laughs> at minimum, kids would understand. I mean, I see people adults on television being like, well, gas prices are up and it's all, you know, so-and-so's fault. I'm like, the president doesn't control gas prices, folks, FYI. You know, attributing people don't have a basic understanding of, of how the system works and how things are done. And I think um, just shifting from this idea that school is to meant to fill jobs to school is to create citizens, that's how I view it. And um, how do we move, how do we approach the future of learning from that perspective? I'll just say in Washington, I, the conversation is more and more about school producing workers. Mm -hmm. It's more about young people leaving high school, being able to enter a career and be successful or be successful in college um, or go through a CTE program, which is 13th or 14th grade, and a career and technical education program where you, you, you're successful after that or go to a program like you were talking about and be successful in the workplace. I don't hear much conversation about being informed citizens, voting, um, knowing how our institutions work, caring about our institutions, um, voting. I, th those sorts of things are not discussed in any of the hearings that I go to on Capitol Hill these days about K-12 education. All right, we'll we are getting the getting hook. The hook. <laughs> so we are going to wrap this up, but I want to just, I think, highlight some of the points that the panelists raised, which is, first of all, innovation, the word is jargon, and we need to really start <laughs> thinking about what that actually means and who gets to do it. We need to rethink changing partnerships so that our public-private partnerships, each, each stakeholder is doing what they are good at, so you don't have companies creating curriculum, I think, as Ruth is pointing out. And I think one of the most important things that is rooted, really rooted up here is that you can't be having the conversation about the future of learning if you're not having the conversation about the reality of segregation in this country and what the implications of social contracts mean for the communities that you're trying to reach. And those are tough. Um, we can argue about steam stream and steam all day, but um, stream. the hard part is really addressing these dis the systemic issues around the social contract. So thank you to all of our panelists. Thank and you. if you want to talk to us more, we'll be on the third floor at the anitab.org Women and Allies Lounge. Um, you can find us there every day.